Good morning and welcome to First Covenant. Please stand and sing with us. Set you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
Welcome to First Covenant Church, everyone. I'm Pastor Evan. We are Disciples Who Make Disciples. We're glad that you're here this morning on this wonderful day. Um, I'm just going to give uh, just a couple of short announcements, and we're going to move to something fun to celebrate. Um, but if you're a guest with us or newer with us, make sure you grab a notebook at the Welcome Center and a sticker or two to stick on a water bottle or your neighbor's water bottle or something. We're glad that you're here with us today, and we're glad that you've joined us in worship. Um, today, after worship, our normal snacks will be there. Um, and we invite you to that time to take a left uh, before you go out the building. Um, Sunday School for Adults is happening today. Confirmation is happening today, but we've kind of moved into our summer scheduling for all other ages, so there's no Sunday options for all the other ages. They can... Oh, whoa, there it is. Wow, I learned something new. So currently, don't pay attention to what I'm saying right now. Pay attention to me later. Thank you. So apparently, there's a lot of Sunday school going on today. Do the normal thing. Ignore everything I just said before, except confirmation students are over there this Sunday instead of over here. So go that way for confirmation students. You'll find your way. Um, then let's celebrate a couple things. And we're going to celebrate graduates in just a moment from high school. Um, but what I did want to say is that our care team, on behalf of the congregation, for teacher appreciation for the daycare downstairs, Kids First. They sent sandwiches down there. We got a nice thank you note from Sylvia and Victoria about that. So that's the church in action. Thank you very much for doing that. That's what we support when we give to the offering plate, things like that. But that's also what our ministries do as well. And we support one another. So that was a really nice thing. I know the care team, if you see the minutes that come out on our weekly emails from different ministries, care team plans to take cookies down every month. I believe they're bringing treadmills down later on sometime. I'm just kidding. Okay. 
I shouldn't make that joke, should I? Again, don't pay attention right now. All right, let's go ahead and let's celebrate our high school graduates. So I know I've got two of four in the room, so if you can both come right here. Um, we have a couple gifts for you. And so what I'd like to do, I did need your microphone though, Emma, I should have told you that, sorry. Okay, um, I won't make you speak for the people that aren't here. We've had four that are graduating, one that attends another church but comes to a um, high school youth group with us, and one is in Texas right now. So you're the two faithful that are right here. Um, what I'd love you to do is say your name and say uh, where you're graduating from and then what's next, okay? That simple, all right. My name is Clara. Um, I am graduating from Lincoln Lutheran High School and I'm going to the University of Wyoming next year to study environment and natural resources and secondary education and social studies. I don't know if it's on, sorry. Okay, my name is Emma, and I'm graduating from Lincoln East High School. I'm going to be attending UNL in the fall with hopes to become a secondary education ceramics teacher. All right. Now, I want to pray for you, but we're going to give you a couple gifts, and we'll get the other gifts to our other students later. So I'll tell you what they are. That's why they're only barely wrapped. I'll give that to you, and I'll give you yours in a moment. But So we have a keychain in here, um, and I'm failing to remember the first. Be strong and courageous uh, from Joshua. And uh, the idea is that we want to give something useful that could potentially get a mailroom key, whatever, those kinds of things, dorm key. Uh, maybe it goes on to your other keychain. I don't know, but we want to give you something that you could use potentially in the next phase of life. And this book, Confronting Christianity, it's a, a one of many good uh, apologetics resources out there that you don't have to read it cover to cover. But when questions might come up, this is a resource that you have. Rebecca McLaughlin wrote it. She does a very good job. I believe she's Scottish, so that makes it interesting with a lilt. Um, let me go ahead and pray. I'll take the mic from you. Lord, thank you for these two graduates, for all the work that's gone into this moment and all the, the effort that it's taken to get to this point. But we also look forward to what you're going to do in their lives. Uh, we pray for them. We lift them up to you today, uh, not only in the celebrations to come in the days ahead, but in the years ahead of uh, education and the, the next phase of putting an effort towards something that's worth it. May they do things that build your kingdom they learn as they grow. And uh, Lord, we thank you for their part in participation in our church and in our life. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand up for you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. steadfast shelter. We seek you and need you and yearn for you. Even when we run from you, even when we wander long and far from your heart and squander our blessings and talents, even then you continue to call us home. We want to come home to you, O oh God, and teach each other. Show us the way, be the path, return us to the calm and the peace of resting in your love. Amen. You may be seated. I now invite the ushers forward. the name 
rescue me from my failing. Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? If you are a child between 0 and 99, come on up. Yeah. And we're going to sit around this little table, so sit somewhere you can see. Well, I want you to be able to see the table, so you might need to scooch like a, in a semicircle. And you might all say a little prayer that this is work. This is going to take some faith. You're going to wait for me to touch. She can. <laughs> okay, we have some apples here, right? They're honey crisp apples. Do you like honey crisps? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just like a, a kind of apple, a variety, but they're very sweet. Um, do they look different? These apples. One is shorter, yep. They're chunkier. chunkier. They're kind of the same color, aren't they? A little bit of green, a little bit of red. Some apples are very dark red, and some are green, some are yellow. These happen to be a mix, but they're pretty Wait, much two apples. Are you going to cut them? I'm going to cut them, but we're going to wait for that, okay? Yeah. Did you know um, <coughs> this one is bad? It's a bad apple. This one's good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this one smells really good. Don't you think so? Mm. We're going to tell this one lots of good things. And if you need an idea, there are some ideas of what you can tell this apple here in this basket. Would you like an idea? Mm, who can think of something really nice? to say to this apple. You are so crispy. You tell it. Give it a hug. Give it a kiss. <laughs> Did everyone hear? He said, you are so crispy. So nice. Who else has something nice to say? You, look, you, look you do look tasty. I agree. What else could we say? <laughs> we want to eat you. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? Oh, I want to eat you so much. <laughs> You're so shiny. There's some ideas. You Looking are so sweet. You are so sweet. <laughs> you are so nice. You smell good. You're the perfect color. How do you think the apple's feeling about this? Pretty good. 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 Well, this is a bad apple. Yeah. 
This is the bad apple. Ew, you smell bad. I'm telling you. Don't you believe me? If you need some ideas, there's some ideas. What could we say to this bad apple? You look like queso. Say it again. You look like queso. You look like queso? <laughs> you look like queso. Oh, I don't see a wormhole. You must be naturally stinky. Say it again. You are so dull, not shiny. We don't want to be friends with you. You are so stinky. Ew. Other one. They're over here. Well, this bad apple, how do, you, how do you think he's feeling right now? I mean, good. Bad. So let's cut open this shiny good apple. The shiny good apple. Mm. So happy. Now let's cut open the bad apple. It's clean. It's not, it's clean. Feel it. Feel it. It's mushy. You feel? Ew. I'm a picky eater. Ooh, it's dripping. Woo! Cut it. That looks like you cut it. Oh, no. Our words, our words really hurt the apple. Inside, we couldn't see from the outside that anything was different. But inside, it was really in the apple's heart. Our words did not make the apple feel good. Did you know that the Bible says that if we call people names, we're in danger of going to hell. That's a hard saying of Jesus. You could die. Or Thankfully, Jesus gave us a way out. Our rescuer gave us a way out. Jesus. We do make mistakes sometimes, and we do hurt others. But a rescuer came to give us a way out and show us how we cannot be in danger of going to hell. Well, you know there's a book Just wait. Yeah, there is. There is? <laughs> Did you know that research says it takes seven times of saying something nice to <laughs> counteract, to balance out saying something mean? Hmm? I, I I if we I say something that. mean, it hurts so bad, it takes seven times of saying something nice to even start to heal someone's heart. That's a lot of nice things to say. All right, friends. Let's talk to Jesus, and then we can go back to our parents. Luke. Are you ready? Jesus, please help us use our words, not as weapons, but to help others grow and be kind and healthy and have their hearts be nice and juicy and lovely inside. <laughs> and um, when we do mess up, please help us come to you so you can rescue our hearts and help us be kind and good once more. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may go back to your parents.
in hard sayings for Jesus this week will be in Matthew 5, starting at verse 21, and I invite you to follow along. As we find that, um, I'm finding that I really enjoyed hearing your voices this morning, and the worship was just, worship music was just wonderful. Um, But I feel a little unsettled, and I'd like to pray as we begin and hear God's word. So, Lord, would you please transcend uh, any humanness that I bring to the proclamation of your word, so your word is heard, not Evan. Would you please transcend any roadblocks that we have to receiving your word this morning, that your word is received, that we hear it, and we take it in, and we are transformed because your son said these words and invites us to his presence and to become a new creation. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Matthew 5, starting at verse 21. We're in hard sayings for Jesus. 22 is the one that you all picked, and I picked it too, actually, as a hard saying to look at. Indeed it is. So let's start at verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you were offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Two weeks uh, in a row now, we'll have two hard sayings of Jesus this week and next week that start with, you've heard it said... But I say to you, this week it's murder, next week it's going to be adultery. Um, And with murder, Jesus is talking here about the sixth commandment of the ten. Number six, you shall not murder, is what that one says. And one may ask legitimately, because some translations have murder and some have kill, which one is it? It appears both by what Jesus is saying here um, and my understanding of the word back in Exodus 20, when we first run into it, it's murder. But there's a particular nuance to it um, that is, it would be murder like we think of it, you know, uh, intentional first degree, I'm, I meant to do it and I'd take someone else's life, that kind of murder. But it also includes some other acts that would be illegal against the law of Moses, um, negligence that leads to manslaughter or something like that would be in that category, like you didn't take care of your property and somebody was there helping you and something went wrong. Um, but it might not Uh, cover something like an axe head flies off and kills somebody that might be different so there's a little more than just willful first degree there's a few other things but it's more than just do not kill it's not quite that it's a little more specific jesus is talking about that here Um, but one one thing that's interesting to note is that jesus points this out and the way that this played out in the old testament with do not murder and you know breaking any of the commandments and the laws is that there was a judge that was going to be involved at some point. There's not a point in Old Testament law where being a vigilante or the town coming together and just running out somebody is going to be the way that should be taken care of. There's supposed to be a judge. And even in cases where there's murder, whether it strictly falls under that or whether it's contestable, uh, there were cities of refuge where people could go so that they could wait out or meet meet it out with a judge, not with the town running them out or something like that. That's important to keep in mind as we look at the rest of what Jesus says here. You've heard it said, do not murder, but he says three different ways that we could murder somebody uh, with heart and then with words that come out. And the first is, you can have anger in your heart towards someone that Jesus says. And the anger that he's talking about uh, seems to be, from the word usage, uh, like a deep-seated, this has been brewing in you against someone this, this is the kind of stuff that's there with grudges, that kind of thing. It's just, it just is in there stewing away, and you're just thinking about the person, thinking about them, angrier and angrier. That kind of thing has been living inside of you. 
And I would just suggest that if we're looking at the text and we're going to be shocked by anything, we, it would be really nice if we were shocked by this and said, yeah, I don't want that. You don't have to say anything else, Jesus. I'm good to go with this one. Because if you notice, the person who is angry in their heart with a brother or sister who has something against them is subject to judgment. By whom? Well, by the living God, it would appear. And shouldn't that be enough to stop us right there? Boy, God, I don't want that kind of anger. Let's stop right there. That's what he's saying. That seems terrifying enough. But then he says, guess what? What about if you have that anger inside of you and then it starts coming out of your mouth towards someone else? What about then? So the next one, he says, raka. And, and it's interesting, raka, and then the other, it's the, in most translations, it has that one left in Aramaic, even though the original is Greek, but the Matthew put it in Aramaic, which is what Jesus would have used. And then the other one, uh, is actually just translated into English, but it's another Aramaic word that Jesus uses. Um, but we'll start with the first one. Raka, he says, fool, blockhead, that kind of thing. Kind of uh, the equivalent, I would understand, to idiot, moron, that kind of thing in our language that, that we might use. And what, what Jesus is saying here is that the insult now not only no longer is just in here, what's going on, your anger towards somebody, but now it's coming out, but it seems like... and. And there's some disagreement in how the scholars cut this up. But my understanding is what I'm giving you this morning. My understanding is of this first one compared to the second one that we see. The first one is, this is the kind of thing that's not muttered under your breath, but it comes out almost impulsively towards someone. He's an idiot. He's a moron. That kind of thing. Like you already have that anger stirring in you. And then it just spills out of you. Maybe, maybe not as maliciously as some other way of, of stating something, but it's still an insult. And it's no longer in your head. Now it's public, and now you have your character on display, and potentially that person's character on display too in all of this. And he says that's subject to the Sanhedrin or the council, depending on your translation, which could just mean any human court or whatever human court's around. It could mean the specific Sanhedrin. But either way, now you're subject to God's judgment and to human judgment, and the first should have terrified us more, but now you're subject to all kinds of judgment from everywhere. Now it's going to affect you in this life very clearly. Then the third one, I would qualify when he says, you fool, the specific word that's there uh, is also in Aramaic in the original. And um, it seems like this would be more like the four-letter version, uh, four-letter word version of what was there before with Raqqa. Um, probably then we're talking about something that's a little more premeditated, a little more deep-seated, and a little more with venom is what I would say. That's what Jesus seems to be saying here. And if you notice, if it weren't terrifying enough to us that the God would judge us for what's in our heart, that's like murder of another person, and it wouldn't terrify us enough that now there's a human court that could potentially be involved in this, then he says this person that's at this point with that poison inside of them coming out towards somebody else is in danger of the fire of hell. He says Gehenna is the word that's used there, which that's a, an idiom or an example, a metaphor that was used in Jesus' day of hell, which was a literal valley, the Valley of Hinnom, that was south of Jerusalem, just barely south, in the shadow of the temple. And that place had been used back in the uh, days of the divided kingdom, before the exile, as a place where people worshipped Moloch, instead of worshipping the living God, or in addition to, it was wrong, and sometimes even sacrificed their own kids, in the, to Moloch in that valley. And then when Josiah came and, and revived uh, the coming back to the law in that divided age, he said, this is going to become the dump. We're going to burn our trash here. It's never going to be used for this again. And the bodies of criminals are going to go here too and be burned in this pile. That's what Jesus is saying. You're cut off from society. You're cut off from God. You're cut off from everything. I mean, that's, that's pretty stiff stuff, right, as you read that. And what I want to do is, as we look at that, we can see the negative, and I have some questions to ask as we, that are pretty challenging as we get in the second half of this, but I want to look at sort of the positive half of what, what we see here with what's related in the text are the results of bad character, and bad character that we would let go on and persist and persist and persist so that it would come out of our mouths in such ways. But if we flip it over and look at the opposite of that, what, what we're called to is to have better character than this. Not just don't murder somebody, but have the character of Jesus Christ is really what he's telling us ultimately. 
And, and so what I want to start with is to say this, and this is our guiding thought for the rest of this time. Good character needs no defense. Good character needs no defense. This is what we should aspire to. Good character needs no defense. But sometimes we, we kind of believe it does. We kind of think we need to defend it because we do sometimes see people who have venom in their heart, who have bad character, who make choices uh, to just get rid of that rage that's in them and aim it at somebody, and they do seem to get ahead sometimes. And frankly, you could have bad character. We see it in the world around us and get ahead for a short while. It works, but only for a short while. And it's not right. And what I look at when it comes to good character and the fact that good character needs no defense, I think of this verse a lot in 1 Peter, and I'll read it for you, talking about character. In 1 Peter 2, verse 18, Peter writes to the church, he says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And I've, I've used this uh, for people that I've, I've counseled over the years who face unjust circumstances and moments when they're pushed a lot in the workforce and in other places where they're pushed on their character to compromise on a good character or on choosing a good character because particularly when you're pushed in difficult ways, even in unjust ways, your character is your currency in those moments when you have nothing else. Your character is your currency, and good character needs no defense. Character that is true and right will stand up even to suffering and insult. And it's the kind of character of Christ, it's the kind of character we should have. That's the flip side of what we're reading here, of what Jesus is aiming us at. And I, I would suggest to you that if you want to see good examples of people who bear under unjust suffering and have good character, the, the persecuted church around the world does this phenomenally in the worst of circumstances. And good character is what's outlined then because we're in Matthew 5, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. If you want to understand that well, I think you go back to the, the first part of the Beatitudes, starting at verse 3, and we're not going to read them all. I'm going to pick one out that I think relates the most to this. Because last week we talked about Jesus is the bread of life. He's the food we need for the life God has provided. And if he's the bread of life, as he says, then that essentially means the meal we need. What's on the menu this week and next week is what I'm going to ask. What's on the me menu this week as far as our character is concerned and having the character of Christ so that we don't have that kind of anger in our heart? If we look at the Sermon on the Mount, I think the one thing that stands out is meekness is what we need. Meekness is the character that we need. There are others from that list that we could pick out of Beatitudes, but meekness is the thing that we need. We need to be the meek who will inherit the earth. And meekness is one of those words that gets misunderstood and misused in our culture quite a lot. It sounds like weak, and so people interpret it as meaning weak. That is absolutely not what it means. It's one of my favorite words I encounter in the New Testament. Uh, it means to be gentle, for sure, but, but really it means to be tamed, but in the best sense. It's, it, it is from a root that means a horse that is broken. So it's horsepower or power aimed and now useful in the right direction. That's what meek is is and that's very powerful it's power under control is what it is somebody who's meek is generally yeah going to be gentle they will be reserved for the most part but when it comes to taking care of what's right and what's true they're bold in those circumstances to step in and do what's right that's what the meek person does they don't until it's right they can stay back until it is but they're bold when they need to do what's what's required and what is right but for our purposes, I think the most important thing to recognize about a meek person is that the meek are self-aware. They're able to look inward and be humble before the living God and humble enough to know their place before God and what their role is in the kingdom. 
That's what a meek person is. They're, they're aware as they look inward of where sin still lurks, and they're humble enough to say, I need to confess this and get it out of here. So I do God's work with boldness. Last thing to point out about the meek, just to keep in the background, is they're, they're prone to be lenient with punishment. That's their gentle. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Um, and they tend to be merciful towards others as a result. But it's that, that middle piece that I want to point out. You know, they're power under control, but they're self-aware. They look inward, and they want to make sure they're right with the living God and right with others. That's a meek person. And so as we see, Jesus says, you know, you've heard said, do not murder, but here's a bunch of ways you can, you can just go almost to that limit and be murdering people in your very heart. And what we should point out, that doesn't mean you should then murder somebody if you're going that route. That's still bad. It's still worse. But Jesus says, but what about, don't justify this stuff in your heart that would lead there. If we're going to have the character that's meek, what we have to recognize, I think, are two important principles. The first is that today's thoughts and attitudes become tomorrow's actions. And I think that's important to remember. Today's thoughts and action, attitudes become tomorrow's actions. And we can have positive attitudes and positive thoughts, true thoughts, true a- attitudes. They become good actions tomorrow. We can also have the opposite. Jesus is pointing that out. You can have false thoughts. You can have uh, thoughts that are not rooted in the truth. You can have negative thoughts. And guess what? Those are also going to lead to tomorrow's actions. And so the question to ask ourselves if we're going to be people of meekness is, what am I feeding my mind and my soul? And I give you two of many New Testament examples we could use uh, where the church is written to there, Ephesians 5 and 2 Timothy 2. Ephesians 5 says, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because they are not, or they, these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And in 2 Timothy, Paul writes, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And you get this kind of thing all over the New Testament. This kind of advice is everywhere. And why is it? Because when we eat the wrong soul food, we develop cynicism, we lack wisdom, we're selfish, we're never satisfied. And it destroys the community God's building, his church. But when we eat the right stuff, the right biblical diet, we learn wisdom, we discern what's worth fighting for, we learn what contentment is and we find it, and our hope is lifted higher than our selfish desires. The other thing about this is today's thoughts and attitudes are tomorrow's actions is that action is an expression of our character. That's why we're talking about it today. Action is an expression of our character. We may not phys- murder someone physically. I hope none of us ever do. Please don't. We may not ever murder someone physically, but we may take satisfaction in the wrong things in this life. We may take satisfaction in bad behavior, and that's not right. And if we follow Jesus, we should live with a character that is above reproach. So that if someone were to make an accusation against us of something that was wrong or something that was of bad character, the next thing out of, the, of somebody's mouth around us is, that doesn't sound like their character. That doesn't sound like who they are. That's how we should live with that kind of character. And Jesus offers us this bread of life. And if we're going to avoid murder from our heart, we should ask to be made meek. That should be our prayer. And so I have four meek-seeking questions that I want to present to you, um, and they're not easy. And they're not just aimed at you, they're aimed at me. Four questions if we're going to consider what it means to be meek and what kind of things Jesus is talking about here. They relate to the text. The first one is this, and I, I, do I fear the act of confession? And I bring this up not to say go, in, this is, we're not talking in the Roman Catholic sense of going to a priest, although I'm totally fine if you have an accountability partner or someone and you confess knowing that the uh, forgiveness comes from Christ, not from them, do it. I think you're stronger for it. But I've been pastor long enough to know that a lot of people fear this. A lot of people fear going to the living God with what's wrong. A meek person does not. A meek person will look inward and find what's wrong, and take it to God. Confession is to admit admit your guilt and sinfulness, 
and then is followed up by seeking forgiveness and turning in a God or direction, repentance. Ephesians 5.12, Paul says, It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. And sometimes we're ashamed of it too. That's why we don't confess. We're ashamed of what's going on inside of our own lives and inside of our own hearts sometimes. And as I said earlier on, good character needs no defense, but if you think of it the reverse, bad character needs constant justification. Constant. We constantly need to tell us ourselves when we're wrong that we're, we're right, really. We need to justify bad behavior some way. We blame others so that we don't have to face it. We hide uh, by never thinking about the difficult things sometimes. We turn to amusements in order to avoid dealing with those hard things. Uh, we simply will talk about shallow things in our lives that are only happy and good vibes instead of dealing with the deeper things in our lives or having any deeper conversation. And what happens is, if we fear this and we don't go to those deeper things and look inward, we live enslaved with the weight of sin. And we live enslaved with the weight of sin, afraid of the path of freedom that Jesus Christ offers. We think that's the best there is, or we live like it is. We live in shame, and we live ashamed. And we think that God can't handle the things that we bring to him. But we shouldn't fear confession because God can handle what we can bring to him. God is a forgiving God. He has a tremendous amount of grace for the things we're ashamed of if we'll only confess. Second thing, and second question of four. There's an example used in the text and of, of leaving the gift at the altar. And I think here's a challenging question. Where do I need to leave my gift and make things right with someone else? This is a meat question. And it's a really challenging one. And perhaps we're, we're not in, uh, so, so that we don't justify the wrong thing here. We're not necessarily in a position where we're in the temple offering our gift in the same way. But you could translate this into, where am I going to the living God with my daily devotions, with going to church, with going to the communion table, with whatever, where I need to actually step back from that and go to someone else and make things right? That's, what, that's what's being asked. Where do I need to leave my gift and go make things right? And this, this is a twofold question. It's a pride-busting question. It bursts our little pride bubble pretty quickly and easily. Because the two examples that Jesus uses here... Uh, when he talks about uh, not having this anger stewing in your heart, he, he talks about, um, he assumes that you and I, whoever is hearing this, are the ones in the wrong. Did you notice that? He didn't assume they were in the wrong. He assumed we're in the wrong. Somebody's taking you to court. You, some brother has something against you. And you're taking the initiative to go and make things right. Is that the case with anyone in your life right now? That's the question that gets presented here. And that's what I think Jesus is very much asking. I was thinking about King Saul as I thought about this question. Um, in the Old Testament, King Saul has a couple moments very closely related to each other. One where he, uh, he's supposed to wait for Samuel, the prophet, to come, the priest and prophet to come, and make a sacrifice with his men. And Saul, King Saul starts freaking out because the men start leaving and Samuel's a little late to the game. And so he does the sacrifice himself, and Samuel shows up and he says, you've done wrong. You weren't supposed to do this. And Saul's like, well, I kind of freaked out, you know, because he didn't show up. And, and Samuel's like, that's not okay. Don't do that. But then it gets worse because then they're not supposed to keep the bounty of the battle that they fought, and Samuel shows up for that a little bit later, and that's the great line in the Old Testament, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear because you kept the thing you weren't supposed to keep, and now you're feeding it to your men. He says, God desires obedience, not the sacrifice. Of course the sacrifice was important, but it's the obedience that goes with it that matters. And that's the same thing at play that Jesus is talking about in this first example. The first example uses, it's, it uses, um, Jesus uses among fellow believers. If a brother or sister believes that, they, that, you have, that there's something against you. And if we can't be honest with one another in the community of, of Jesus, if we create false, we end up creating a false community is what happens. 
where we think we're close, we think we're tight-knit, but we can't actually be honest with each other. When we do this, when, we aren't, when we're just giving the gifts, when we're just doing the motions without actually being obedient to God in this way. It creates false community. We don't end up honoring God. We don't end up honoring one another. It creates an environment that's less honest and closed off, and we're less inclined to do the other thing, to confess, too. We're less inclined to be faithful all around. Where do I need to leave my gift and go make things right? Third question is, do I ever pray for people who I dislike or who have hurt me? And the issue with deep-seated anger that Jesus is talking about here, anger in your heart, is that it becomes poisonous over time. And it doesn't take long. It becomes poisonous, and we think that we're shooting that poison or the venom or whatever you're going to use there at someone else, but on, quite honestly, a poisoned heart kills someone. It just kills you is what it does. It deteriorates your own life and your own character over time. Jesus, in this same sermon, says, pray for your enemies. And maybe that's not people that you dislike or that dislike you or whatever, but that falls in the same uh, command to pray for those people. Why does he say this? I would suggest that it's because it's one of the biggest preventatives to letting anger develop into a poisoned heart, is if you pray when the relationship is rocky or broken for the other person. And I'll be, uh, I'll be transparent on one thing here, because I can, I can relate to the stewing anger in your heart. I remember in my early 20s, I had a moment where I realized, and I don't like even talking about it, I hated it, where I realized I actually had hatred towards a group of people. And I remember the feeling. I still remember the feeling. I didn't even like talking about it. And it was such an awful feeling to know that that was in there, first of all, and to have that feeling. And I'm, I'm thankful now that I had it because I pray for people who I'm out of relationship with readily because I never want to feel hatred for someone like that. I never want that anger to stew, and nobody should want that in their heart. I pray, as a pastor, I've had enough moments over the years in multiple churches, multiple ministry settings where things don't always go according to plan. And I pray for people with whom I don't have a right relationship regularly. I pray for their well-being. I pray for their success in family, in jobs, in hobbies. I pray for those kinds of things because I do not want that anger and hatred to stew in my heart. I want to be meek in those things. I don't always get it right, but I will not live with a poisoned heart. None of us should want that. Lastly, short but most challenging question of all. If I live with an angry heart, what kind of relationship should I expect to have with a loving and holy God? If I live with an angry heart, what kind of relationship should I expect to have with a holy and loving God? In 1 John 3, 15, we read, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. This isn't the way we're supposed to be. Good character needs no defense. Meekness is what we should develop. It's actually fruit of the Spirit, as I said and so we need to confess to the living God where we don't have that. Ask the Holy Spirit to enter in and reshape our desires so they're righteous like God. Nothing else. Let's pray, and uh, I'm going to invite the band to come forward while I pray, and then I'm actually going to read one more scripture, and then we'll sing our final song. Lord, thank you for the, the opportunity to be made right through your son Jesus Christ. There are so many things that can go wrong in this world, so many things that can go wrong in this life. There are so many ways that we can live into our human nature, the sinful nature, rather than what you've called us to. We're created in your image. We're supposed to be redeemed to be like your son Jesus Christ, so we're made like you again and righteous. And yet there are so many things that pull and tug away at us, to pull us away. There are so many voices in this culture that tell us that we'd be more satisfied if we just said the four-letter words of the things that were rude towards someone else. And yet, Lord, that's not what you've called us to. That's not who you've called us to be. You've called us to be people who, who pray for those with whom we're out of communion. You've called us for those who live with the living and holy God as loving and holy people. 
remade in the image of Christ. Redeem us today. Redeem our hearts, Lord. Redeem our lives. Redeem our minds. Amen. I want to read one scripture today, and you can keep playing. We did not read the Pentecost scripture earlier. It was in the plan. I, uh, a lot of humanness. I didn't get us there. So can I read that real quick, and then we'll sing our last song? Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up at the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May we be those people who confess this. Let's sing and stand. Jesus, the name above every other 
faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have been crucified and have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. May you receive these words, go to Sunday school, enjoy the fellowship of one another. Go in peace.